The chemistry of monosaccharides stems from the typical behavior of their two characteristic functional groups, carbonyls and hydroxyl groups. You should recall that the carbonyl group may act as an electrophile and commonly undergoes nucleophilic addition in the presence of reactive non-bonding lone pairs or pi bonds. Much of the reactivity of monosaccharides stems from this idea. However, you should also remember that the carbonyl oxygen may act as a base and that the alpha position to a carbonyl is mildly acidic with a pKa of about 20 typically. Thus, proton transfer steps are important for the carbonyl functionality as well. Looking only at the carbonyl group for now, we can recognize that in the presence of water, which is a decent nucleophile, and an acid or base catalyst, the aldehyde may undergo nucleophilic attack and proton transfer to generate an aldehyde hydrate, or geminal diol. When the nucleophile is an alcohol instead of water, a hemiacetal functional group results through the exact same mechanism. Let's look now at the array of hydroxyl groups associated with monosaccharides. The alcohol functional group is characterized by the acidity of the OH proton and its ability to act as a nucleophile using one of oxygen's lone pairs. Immediately, you may recognize that the nucleophilic hydroxyl group and the electrophilic carbonyl group are well paired for intramolecular chemistry. Hemiacetal formation may take place in an intramolecular sense through the same mechanism of nucleophilic addition and proton transfer that we just discussed to give a cyclic hemiacetal. In fact, in the presence of just a minuscule amount of acid or base, this process is quite rapid. When the ring formed possesses five or six atoms, equilibrium heavily favors the cyclic hemiacetal form. Take a moment to consider why we should expect five and six-membered cyclic hemiacetals to be more favorable than their corresponding open forms. Ring closing to form a cyclic hemiacetal introduces both stereochemical and site selectivity issues. First of all, in relatively long sugars, there may be multiple hydroxyl groups that can react with the carbonyl group. This is a site selectivity issue since the hydroxyl groups in question are constitutionally heterotopic. In the example of D-glucose that you see here, the red hydroxyl group may react to give a five-membered ring, or the blue hydroxyl group may react to give a six-membered ring. Which would you expect to be favored? Take a moment to think about this, as we'll come back to it soon. Because of their similarity to furan and pyran, we call the five- and six-membered forms furanoses and pyranoses, respectively. You should take a moment to understand how this Fischer projection of a cyclic sugar tells you the configuration of each stereocenter. In fact, the convention for cyclic sugars is identical to the linear convention. The cyclizing hydroxyl group is drawn wrapped around to illustrate the configuration of the new stereocenter, the former aldehyde carbon. Notice that in both the pyranose and furanose, a new stereocenter has been created at carbon-1 after the cyclization process. Try making a model of a pyranose and drawing its fissure projection and line angle views. This table shows you the relative amounts of furanose and pyranose form for a variety of sugars. Notice that in every case the pyranose, or six-membered form, dominates. Why is this the case? An examination of the strain energy associated with a variety of ring sizes reveals the answer. Six-membered rings lack ring strain. In fact, the difference between five- and six-membered rings is great enough that we would expect almost no furanose form at equilibrium. For altrose, talose, and idose, something else besides ring strain must be influencing the equilibrium, otherwise we would see about 100% of the pyranose form in every case. What factor associated with the pyranose form might be causing the larger proportion of furanose form for these sugars? Given the significant favorability of the cyclic hemiacetal forms, you may wonder how carbonyl chemistry, such as hydration, is even possible for sugars that can form rings. The key thing to notice is that hemiacetal formation is an equilibrium, so there's always a tiny amount of open form present. Under conditions where the open form's carbonyl group may react, such as in the presence of a reducing agent like sodium borohydride, it does so and leaves behind a disturbed equilibrium. Consistent with Le Chatelier's principle, 
more of the open form is produced, which then reacts with the reducing agent until all of the sugar is consumed. This example illustrates why it is important to consider the open form of sugars even when it isn't provided and isn't present in large amounts at equilibrium.